Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to another edition of Inside Talk. My name is Dustin Smith, and I work here on the marketing team at Talk. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today um, from wherever you're logging in from, whether it be morning, afternoon, or evening. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, it's wonderful to have you with us. And for those who are returning, uh, welcome back. It's great to see you again, and thanks for joining again. We've got another special presentation today, uh, this time a journey to Antarctica, believe it or not, with our friend uh, Peter Bassett. This platform, Inside Talk, is something we created in our 95th year, 2020, to connect with one another while we unfortunately uh, cannot travel. Um, it's a way for us to share you, with you the world's great destinations, some, some cultural sites, some expeditions, uh, and expert knowledge from our partners such as Peter and also our Talk directors. We hope today provides you with a small peek at what a cruise to Antarctica with Talc is really like and provide some inspiration for your next journey. Before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items I'd like to cover off on. You are all uh, joining us today on Zoom webinar and you are on mute. If you do have any questions, please post them into the chat. I will be monitoring that throughout the presentation um, and Peter will stop twice for a couple question uh, sessions after two of the videos we're gonna share. Um, and we will have a little bit of time at the end for a short Q&A as well, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, today's presentation will last roughly about an hour, but with those Q&A sessions, it might go a little bit over. Uh, Peter's a wonderful storyteller and has a wealth of knowledge about Antarctica, so he may go a bit longer as he describes the experience. Also, we have live closed captioning today uh, for today's session. If you'd like that, you have the option to toggle that on or off at the bottom of your screen via show or hide subtitle. Um, today's lecture will be recorded, and like all of our uh, previous Inside Talc events, it will be up on our blog, The Talker, and uh, shared out with you in our newsletter, The Compass, um, in the coming days. We're also streaming today on uh, live on Facebook, so if you do have any technical difficulties or you wanna invite some friends last minute, have them log into our Talc Facebook page and you can see the presentation there as well. So, as mentioned, today we are joined by an award-winning award wildlife filmmaker, Peter Bassett. Um, he's been a filmmaker and producer on many, many widely acclaimed landmark series with David Attenborough. Um, he has over 30 years of experience managing productions as a, a special wildlife film producer. And Tauk, uh, us, we have the great fortune of welcoming Peter on select journeys to Antarctica as our special guest hosts, um, and those are always extremely well received. So without further ado, I will now turn this over to Peter to start the journey. Peter. Hi there, everybody. Welcome. Uh, can, you, can you see me, Dustin? Have I come through okay? You're all, you're all set. Go ahead. Oh, fantastic. Oh, well, I'm delighted uh, to, to know that there's, I'm being joined by, is it 3,000 people? I cannot believe it. So Hello, and I also want to say and extend a special welcome to all the people I've travelled with the last three or four trips. Um, thank you all very much indeed for all of your emails today. Uh, much appreciated. Um, usually I work with a bit of feedback with the audience, but obviously I haven't got that today. And so please, as Dustin said, send him a message if you've got a question. So that's the, the slightly negative side. On the positive side, you can't throw anything at me, which makes a change. Um, so that's good from here. Um, and just to pick up on what Dustin said, I've been a wildlife filmmaker for over 35 years. I've been so fortunate to travel all around the world. And one of the questions I'm asked the most is, where is your most favorite place on earth? And I have to say, it's, it's Antarctica. And um, so uh, it was a love affair for me since 1991 when I uh, worked on a series called Life in the Freezer. I'll tell you that in a moment. Uh, but as Dustin said, I've been on four polar trips with Tauk and hand on heart, I have loved every one of them. And so um, Dustin and his team have asked me if I would um, just tell you a little bit about what it's like to be on a trip to the Antarctic Peninsula on a, a Tauk tour, um, give you an idea of what you might see, and also ask some, answer some of those questions that most of you might have. Uh, because I know going to a remote place like the Antarctic can feel a bit daunting to some people. So hopefully I can allay some of your fears there. Um, so away we go. Um, 
where are we? It is an absolute magical place. Um, as I said, it's so beautiful. Everywhere you look, there is a, a wonderful image. This is a, a Gen 2 penguin. And, um, but before I go into the Antarctic, sorry for going off on a sideways move there, but um, I was going to tell you a little bit about myself, of course, because although Dustin said I've worked uh, at the BBC with uh, David Attenborough, I have worked on series like Life of Birds, Life in the Undergrowth. I've worked on a series called Nature's Great Events with David, doing a film on the on the um, on the Rock of Ango. Uh, but it was Life in the Freezer in 1991, still the only series the BBC has done solely on the Antarctic uh, that kind of captured my heart. And so I want to just go a little bit into detail for that. Why is Antarctica so special? Well, well actually, as you can see, it is. Uh, an inspiring place, overwhelmingly beautiful. Um, and I do hope you get a chance to, um, to, to visit. Everywhere, as I said, everywhere you look, every lighting condition, it looks dramatic. And I, I can lose myself in this magical place. Um, in fact, I should have asked Dustin to uh, ask you all to switch your heating off so you could get into the mood and perhaps open the windows to get a bit of air going. Um, and so, as I said, I went there, first of all, in 1991. I've been there eight times since. But in 1991, it's a very, very different place. And during this talk, I'd like to show you, well, I'll take you on a tour, a virtual tour of Antarctica, but also seed in a few things that I've done in the past, uh, show you a little bit of us in action uh, when we were making that series. And so, if you don't mind, we'll go back to 1991 now, when there were no mobile phones, the, the best technology in the office was a fax machine. And things were, as I said, were a lot different then, including me. Um, this was me in 1991. I actually had some hair then. And, and I was under the belief that if you went to Antarctica, that you had to have a big thick beard like Shackleton and Scott. Um, and sadly, after three months, this is all I could grow. So Antarctica is responsible for the first time I tried to grow a beard and also the last time because it was pitiful. <laughs> um, and I've got to say, sorry, I'm going off on a digression already. When I came back home looking like this, my elder brother said to me that the last time I ever saw anything like that, the whole herd had to be destroyed. So I made a note to myself then, never ever grow a beard again. So that was it. So in 1991, it was a real, real expedition to make Life in the Freezer. It was a six part series for BBC One. Um, and we went down for three months at a time. And this is our crew on the first trip. There are six different cameramen in amongst that lot. Uh, we had a 105 foot long uh, research vessel for our dive team uh, that had two diving cameramen. And then we also had a small yacht, uh, 55 foot long, that we used like a taxi that ferried uh, the land-based uh, cameramen to various locations. And I'll just show you the type of um, situation we found ourselves in. Can you see in the middle here, can you see my cursor, Dustin? That is our yacht, the Damien 2 then. And we were able to get to places that were inaccessible to a lot of, of ships. Um, but as you can see, we were just lost in this vast, vast landscape. But it was a wonderful experience. And I want to compare that to a tank trip. So we were in a 155-foot well, yacht a lot of the time. And this is the Ponon ship El Boreal uh, in Antarctica on the last trip I went on. Uh, as you can see, a much bigger, more modern ship, but still totally lost in this epic landscape. Um, there it is. It's, uh, it can only take, I think it takes less than 200 passengers to Antarctica, so it's not a vast ship and uh, it has wonderful stabilizers and also fantastic French cuisine which made a change for me because when we were filming in 1991 we existed mainly on dehydrated mutton granules that, uh, and I must admit that played have it with the old digestion, but it's absolutely perfect <laughs> on this ship. And so I wanted to, 
as I said, take you on a journey on that ship to Antarctica. But there are a few things that I want to, to say to you, like tips, bits of advice that I've picked up from being on the cruises before. Because I want to say, if you do go, please, please make sure that you, if you buy a new camera, like a lot of people do, take it out of the box and use it before you go down there. Don't open the box in Antarctica. I've had to help out quite a few people who didn't have batteries or car, uh, cards or charger cables. And so try and get used to it um, before you go down there. And many people have cameras that come with a mode that allows you to take lots of lots and lots of pictures but not a very good quality and so it's always best to change uh, the settings before you go down there and so th these basically are the cameras that I take with me um, so I've got a DSLR there with a 200 mil lens I've got a, a point and shoot camera the yellow one that actually I can take out in rainy weather and also I've got a, a mobile phone and between those three I can take every picture I really want and uh, just to let you know that I went on a cruise that was almost totally um, full of wildlife photographers and they had a big big competition during the trip and at the end of the trip the winning shot that they all thought summed up the Antarctic more than any other was shot on a mobile phone so you don't have to have you know thousands and thousands of pounds worth of equipment so the other tank tip is that if you go to Antarctica don't worry about taking jackets they are supplied when you're there and that is such a help um, so you don't have to travel with these parkas or with Wellington boots the the ship has them for you which is fantastic and I know if you live in Palm Springs you probably don't have a coat anyway so don't have to worry about it you get that on the ship um, and the other thing, if you're feeling a little bit daunted, as I said, then on the ship, you have wonderful, wonderful Tauk tour directors. I've got to say, I don't know where you find them, but they are an absolute joy to work with. Here's a little uh, name check for Mel Melissa, Alison and Rob, um, and they um, will help you um, with your layering, your clothing and every little um, question you might have. And here are a few others that some of you may have traveled with, Dale, uh, Bill, Merck, Dante and Stacey. Um, and they are there to make your journey a, a pleasant one. So away we go. Um, as you probably know, you fly into Buenos Aires in Argentina here, then take another internal flight to Ushuaia. And then you pick up the ship that takes you down to the Antarctic Peninsula. And um, if you're not familiar with the Antarctic, I suppose you do know that it's, you know, it's about one and a half times the, st the size of the United States. Um, and it's the, the coldest, the stormiest, the driest continent on earth. And, but where you're going to, the Antarctic Peninsula, is like a little panhandle. I don't know if you can see it here. And that's where, in the summer, most of the snow-free area, areas are and where the wildlife congregates. And so that's why people tend to visit that area. Um, this is a trip without a specific itinerary. I know people like to know exactly where they're going. The Antarctic doesn't work like that. The, the ships have a rough idea where they're going, but the, it really depends on the weather and ice conditions. And so if you look at that line, it doesn't really say where you're going on the Antarctic Peninsula. It's just that that's where you'll be. And to be honest, I think that's part of the joy. It's, it's an expedition after all. You just go with the flow and you have an expedition team on board that really uh, want you to have the best experience possible and make the most of the conditions so you can relax with that. Um, if you take a little closer look at this map, you'll see Deception Island. I'm going to come to that in a moment. Um, but also there's this, this phrase, Drake Passage, um, that some of you might be aware of. It's some people say it's the stormiest sea in the world, and I know that it has got one hell of a reputation. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the rough sea that sometimes you get there, uh, because one of the, the points that uh, one of the uh, clients said to me once is that, please, please tell people, don't be put off 
by, by the Drake Passage. Um, I can't believe I'm saying that. I was the worst, worst traveller from life in the freezer days. I always got seasick. Even if I overfilled the bath, it seemed I'd get seasick. And But with today's medications and seeing doctors beforehand, you can really uh, put it to bed and, and not worry about it. Because, yeah, it's the last thing you want. I, I, somebody once said to me that being seasick was um, uh, the only form of death that you recover from, which if you are a sufferer, it's really, really apt. Uh, but as I said, if you get the right medication now, it's, it's, it's not a problem. And um, so I wouldn't think of it as a uh, something to, to dread. In fact, I find it one of the highlights of my trip because you can take the time to read a little bit, to think that you are actually traveling in the in the same uh, direction as some of these early explorers from 200 years ago. It's amazing to think that the, the first people to spot Antarctica were there 200 years ago to this, you know, this year. Uh, but you'll be on a lovely safe uh, ship rather than a wooden boat with, with sails. Um, and so why, I, in fact, I quite like it when there is a bit of, bit of a few waves because uh, when the the Drake's Passage is um, still, they call it the Drake Lake, as opposed to the Drake Shake, when it's got a bit uh, of, a, of a storm going through it. But when it's completely still, you don't see uh, so many birds. And when you're on this um, journey, honestly, it's, you've got to look all over the, um, out of your window and from the bridge all the time because there's constant companions. These are um, pintado petrels and they fly very, very, very closely to the, um, to the ship. This is um, a southern fulmar and they just magically appear from behind the waves. But if it's still and there are no wind movements, you will not see the birds. They need the, the wind for, for uplift. And so um, when it is a drake lake, you won't see any of these birds, which is such a shame. Uh, this one is a, um, a, a, a giant petrel, and I've put this in to show you that, uh, that they are sometimes called tube noses, these groups of birds. And can you see this big tube on the top of the bill? Um, that uh, gives these birds an amazing um, sense of smell to find food and also to, to find the, their nest sites on the, the remote, remote islands where they, they, they breed. Um, the wingspan of that bird is about six feet long. This is a, uh, a black browed pet, pet, uh, a black browed albatross, and it is uh, it has wingspan of about eight feet, and they are one of the most graceful birds you can see. And on most trips, nearly every trip, I think I've seen these birds. But what I'm really, really waiting for is the appearance of one of these. This is a, uh, a wandering albatross, and it's hard to get scale here, I know, uh, but I'll get a bit closer. That bird there, from wingtip to wingtip, is about 12 feet. Just look across your room at home now to 12 feet and just see how, how long the wingspan is. It's incredible. That's two of me and more um, flying past. And Oops, just click on a bit. And they get can get incredibly close. You're probably thinking to myself, oh, you have to have the, a very, very expensive lens to take pictures like this to make them that close. Honestly, you don't. This is on a 250 millimeter lens, if you know about photography, um, and is taken from the balcony outside my room. And just to prove that, when I followed that bird a lot, there you are, that is the roof of my balcony. And so it is that, that close to the, um, to, the, uh, uh, to the ship. And ooh, there we go. And I just wanted to say, I, there was a, a very a famous American uh, ornithologist called Robert Murphy. And in 1912, he wrote after seeing one of these birds that I now belong to a higher cult of mortals for I have seen the albatross. 
And I think that's wonderful because when you do see them, you do feel uh, very, very privileged. So you're going across, what other tips have we got? If you can, please, please try and not go online. Just uh, stay uh, off the grid, that's what I would say. When I go away, I don't read the newspapers or anything. I try and leave all that behind because how often in life can you go into a bubble where you don't have modern distractions? Uh, and I love the way, in fact, sometimes you forget what day of the week it is very, very quickly. And so on the way down, as you start to anticipate going to Antarctica, you can get, yeah, you, you start to get lost in it. And I, and I love that. And um, one of the, the guests once said to me, he said, I have, a, I have a golden rule when I'm traveling. He said, I only read the menu and the wine list. I don't distract myself with anything up to date and I get lost. And I think, yeah, that's great. Yes. <laughs> and so on our virtual tour, we are now heading across the Drake Passage, going into the colder water, waters of the Antarctic uh, Ocean. And this is the next highlight, your first iceberg. This is my very, very first iceberg. I remember it vividly now. It appeared out of the mist as we went over the Antarctic Convergence, which is the meeting of the oceans. And that's a few hundred yards across. And I was just in awe of this. In fact, Bill Mercadante, who was one of the tour directors, has been to Antarctica 65 times and he said to me, I've never lost that awe of looking at, a, at a, an iceberg. And, and I think, wow, yeah, I can, I can believe it. Mind you, Bill says the same about desserts in the, in the French restaurants as well, but we won't go there. Sorry, Bill, if you're, <laughs> if you're listening. Um, so off we go, we've seen the, uh, the icebergs. And if you, you will see, every shade of blue you can think of and everyone is different as it gets acted upon by the uh, the waves and i just thought that this might be a good time for you to have a little break from my voice because on the the tank trips to antarctica they have got three special videos that actually were produced for them by the bbc to give you a, an insight to the location and uh, to get a, a feeling of that for, for what you're about to see. And so I'm gonna hand over to Dustin now to, um, to play a little piece from one of these, vin these vignettes, these little videos about icebergs. There's no doubt when you see an iceberg in all its glory, you're just totally captivated by the shapes, by the size, by the colour. And that colour will completely depend on whether you see it under overcast skies or whether you see it in clear sunshine, whether the sun is behind it or whether the sun is shining down onto the face that you see. As you cruise past the icebergs, they're changing their shape all the time because as soon as they're formed, they begin to get weathered by the wind and the, the sea conditions above. But more importantly, whatever is lying below the water and seven eighths of an iceberg is lying below the water, that's getting worked upon by the sea. And it's lovely when you're diving with them underwater and you look up and you've got all these little dimples and you can see them and it's like finely carved facets of a jewel. You go to the Antarctic to find what are called tabular icebergs. Those flat-topped icebergs are carved. They break off from the edge of the ice shelf. And the ice shelves around Antarctica are flat-topped areas of glacier which are floating out to sea. 
and at the seaward edge these cracks form and these big tabular icebergs drift away. And those tabular bergs are absolutely classic of the Antarctic. You only find them in the Antarctic and they can be huge, maybe 20, maybe even 30 metres high, 10, 20, even 40 miles long. Okay, Peter, back over to you. But we do have a couple questions if you want to take a couple right now. Uh, yeah, what I'll do is, if you don't mind, I'll just try and um, get the, the screen share back up again. Sure, go ahead. That, if that's all right. And... Um, do, 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 do. How's that? Is that back online again? You're back online. So there was a couple questions that came through, actually multiple that came through about the Drake Passage when you were, when you were talking through that. Um, a lot centered on, if you know, what causes it to be so rough at some times? Um, does the timing matter in terms of when you go down there, if it's more rough or less rough? Um, and about how long does it take to pass through? Um, let's say that, um, well, it's a, a completely, there is no land there for a, uh, to block the sea, the ocean as it swirls around. And um, the, so that there are some big, big waves there. With regard to um, the time of year, um, I, I'm not quite sure, to be honest, uh, Dustin, but when we go down between January and March very often, um, it's, you just can't predict it. I have, I've got to say, more time than not, this is the famous last words now, it's been more like a Drake Lake than a Drake Shake. Um, and today's um, captains and ships, they, they actually do uh, have courses and take directions which make the, uh, the impact of the, of, the, of the fetch of the waves less. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I think that, um, as I said, I hate to tempt fate, but I, I've, it, it's, 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 been a, it's not been as bad as I have um, expected it to be. And what was the other question again, sorry? How long uh, to get through it? Oh yeah, well, I, the, the tank, uh, sorry, the, the Ponon ships are very quick. So we've, we're across in, in three days sometime, less than three days. Great. Okay, cool. uh, when I went over in, uh, so it's two and a bit days actually, when we went over um, uh, for Life in the Freezer, we were going at eight knots, so it took us four, four days or so, and we were bobbing around like a cork. But um, yes, the stabilizers on these ships, I think Panon uh, bragged that there's, there's, there's the biggest, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a comfortable, uh, a more comfortable ride with them. Good. Um, Great. And, uh, Justin, well, can I just say, um, uh, can you hear, can everybody hear me okay? Um, obviously, Ryan, I, I can't get any feedback. I just wanted to make sure that I'm not talking too quickly or too quietly or too loudly, etc. I think, I think you're doing good, Peter. I think you're okay. Why don't we keep going in the interest of time and we'll do a little bit more questions at the end. Okay. Um, well, I'll pick up, that was uh, one of the videos that's shown in this, uh, in the lecture th theatre on the ship. And this is where I give my talks. Yeah, it looks like one of my mo more popular talks there. Um, no, Dustin couldn't find any shots of me uh, lecturing, but um, I usually give six one hour talks on you know, wildlife filmmaking adventures in Antarctica and beyond elsewhere around the world. And I show pictures of us uh, with the challenges of filming in Antarctica. Um, and what it's like to live on a penguin colony, etc. Um, I've got to say, most of the time, I'm talking about the things that go wrong. People seem to enjoy that a lot more. But uh, that's what happens in the uh, in this lecture theatre. And I've got, but I've got to say that the wildlife always, always comes first. So on my first talk last year, uh, halfway through, 
there was a uh, an announcement on the tannoy to say that the one of the world's rarest whales was being seen off the starboard bow and it's amazing to think that people who were being helped down the steps to their seat with 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 walking aids when they heard that there is a special whale were running <laughs> out of the lecture the theater pushing people out of the way um, and it was for one of these uh, this is from thank you again bill for the lending of this picture i didn't get there in time unfortunately uh, but this is a type d killer whale and one of the whale experts on the ship actually was in tears um, they are so so rarely seen and it's just typical of a trip to antarctica you never know what is going to pop up and um and one of these did and um my lecture had to be picked up again on another day which is quite right too um so you're getting closer to the An the antarctic peninsula you start to see little black specks on some of the icebergs and you want to take some binoculars with you as well as a camera if you can because those little specks are in fact your first penguins and once again people never forget their first encounter with penguins most people will see them porpoising like this these are gen 2 penguins um you know that because of the little white headphones um they've got on their head uh, i always think they're listening to music um and they leap out of the water as they swim like this in order to breathe and if you look at both of those birds you can see their bills are just fractionally open so as they swim quickly they can leap above the water and, and breathe and they are going to the first places on the land that are free from snow and ice and that's usually on the little on the hilltops this was taken before christmas um, and what you see on the penguin colonies really depends on what time of the year you go before christmas you'll see them with nests and maybe some eggs and after Christmas, you'll see the chicks uh, in various forms of development. Um, and I just wanted to hop back again to 1991 and my first landing place. And this is Deception Island that I showed you on the map earlier. And if you look very, very closely, if you look at where the cursor is, those are our tents at the bottom of the slope there. And this is a huge amphitheater with tens of thousands of penguins on and this was my first encounter with antarctica and once again i can remember it vividly um, and this was the view from my tent uh, a penguin walkway going straight past i thought wow i was pinching myself all the time to think i'd come to this wonderful wonderful place and we come to film the uh, breeding behavior of um the the only penguin to fly well actually it's a sorry it's a, i'm joking that's a, a chin strap penguin just coming in uh, on the landing beach um, and we wanted to film as i said the breeding behavior of these chin strap penguins and on deception island at the right place every evening you get a special rush hour and this is um as i said in the evening and the the parents, the adults are coming back after a day's feeding and returning to their nests. And we were blown away. In fact, I think David Attenborough called it nature's greatest rush hour, which I thought was very appropriate. Um, and if you look very closely in this one, you can, <laughs> there's always one, isn't there? That's, uh, that's going the wrong way. I don't know if you can see that one in the middle, middle there. So, um, but one of the things about Antarctica is that you've got to be prepared for massive swings in weather. So when we arrived, it was beautiful, sunny weather. The next morning, it was like this. And here are our tents on the hills around. You can see the hillsides are peppered with the thousands of chinstrap penguins all of, along here and just around the back here. Lovely, lovely, um, colony of, of, of penguins um, I, we weren't too happy because our tents leaked and also it was incredibly cold uh, <laughs> and we didn't have the uh, and it's for, by some reason we don't know why we had three season instead of four season sleeping bags so we were quite chilly um, 
but that is the same view that I showed you just a minute ago of the evening rush hour about a day or so later. It looks a completely different place, doesn't it? So that's one of the things that can happen in Antarctica. And um, we were meant to be there for about seven days to film that sequence. Um, but without going into too much detail, you have to come on to a trip and I'll tell you more. But this turned out to be my most grueling, most exhausting trip that I'd ever been on in 30 years. Um, it included a major storm which damaged our tents. We even had the threat of a volcanic eruption. Um, and so instead of a week, I was there for almost a month. Um, but as I said, I have to keep that story for another day. And so what will your experience be? I hope you can get the opportunity to go there. Well, the ship can get you very close to some of these colonies and you leave the ship and go to these landing beaches in zodiacs like this. Um, there's only a maximum of 100 people allowed on shore at a time. And so you can kind of go for a wander and lose yourself a bit. Is a take somebody taking a picture as we went past a little iceberg on the way in and this is the ship in um, at deception island that i showed you just a minute ago it's one of the f i think probably the only place on earth where you can take a cruise ship you can take it into the flooded crater of an active volcano um and it's a place that i've been to on every trip with tank and so it is a regular spot so hopefully you can't guarantee but hopefully the trip would go there. And uh, this is uh, me having a little chat to a few people at Deception Island. And uh, funnily enough, a few minutes after this picture was taken, I had everybody on their hands and knees smelling the ground because, uh, as I said, it's an active volcano. And they, you can smell the sulfur coming through with the heat uh, from the soil. Because uh, apart from giving lectures, I really, really enjoy going on shore, answering people's questions, pointing out behaviours that they might not see, um, as well as actually I have um, most meal times with different people as well, just to kind of, well, as I said, it's the most enjoyable part of the trip for me. So, um, and what I would say is that when you go on shore, don't just wander as fast as you can try and take as much in um, it's best to try and find places where things are happening and on a penguin colony always look for where the penguins come in and out of the water um, don't get too close you know five meters you can't get within that distance but that's close enough to see the the birds acting normally and in fact if you stop still most of the time they're very curious and they'll come and have a look at you but this is a um, these are penguin, these are Jenju penguins again with their headphones on, um, coming down from the colony and going into the water. And if you find the right place, you can just indulge yourself as they all just do like a diving display and jump into the water. And if you, if you like photography and you've got a, a, a long lens or and a camera that can take high speed shots, then you can ab have an absolute field day uh, in these locations. Um, as I said, with a high, high enough shutter speed, you can freeze the action like this. Um, you can just lose yourself. I, you know, 10, 15 minutes watching Penguin go in will, will go just like that. And don't just forget about them. When they go into the water, the penguins actually have just come down from the colony, so they're dirty. And so I say to people, no, just, just watch, no, watch them, watch them out there. And they form these little bathing huddles I can you can see them there and they all start bathing and cleaning themselves and they do it really vigorously they go over on their backs feet up in the air cleaning the the mud and various bits of penguin penguin guano that they've picked up whilst they've been on shore and I absolutely love these special times and if you take the time to look carefully you see little oddities like this can you see there's a, a white one here this uh, is a leucistic penguin uh, where all the black, well, blonde feathers replace the, the black ones. But a lot of people just missed it as they walked past. And I, think I try to encourage people just to stop 
and just let it um, and let things happen in, in front of you and uh, you'll really appreciate it. So I just uh, wanted to perhaps show another uh, clip now. It's a, of a bit of behaviour that I've seen on every tag trip and when I point it out to people they love it and they point out to all of their friends and so I won't say any more. It's part of another one of those Tauk um, vignette videos. And so I hope you enjoy this little bit of behavior of, um, from a daily penguin this time. So over to you, uh, Justin. Dustin, sorry. <laughs> The male Adelis are the first to return and begin building nests from stones. The females will join them in a few days. To win favour, males must impress with the quality of their nest. So construction requires the careful selection of building materials. Time is of the essence and the supply of stones is at a premium. Some penguins turn to a life of crime. The nests are packed so closely together that stealing your neighbor's stones is the quickest way of assembling your own nest. The victim of the crime is neither aware of the thief, nor that he's on the lookout for more ill-gotten gains. nest is progressing nicely, probably because he keeps a particularly sharp watch out for robbers. After all, it takes one to know one. That's pretty funny, Peter. Um, oh, I, gonna, love, I, I love that clip. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you get your slides up again, and then I'll, I'll turn it right over to you in the interest of time, and you can keep rolling, and then we'll do some questions at the end. Does that sound good? Uh, yeah, I'll just um, put that on there. So screen share. No, I hope you enjoyed that clip, and... As I said, it's something that uh, I've seen on, on every uh, trip with Tauk because they don't just do it when they first start uh, making nests, even when they've got large chicks. There's a compulsion to steal somebody else's um, nest stones. And um, we see it a lot with Gen 2 penguins. I'd love to one day kind of almost put markers on a stone and work out how many nests one stone will go to during a season. It must be quite a few, but um, yeah, and when, I, when I point it out to people, um, they love it. As I said, fantastic. So if you've got any little questions that uh, we wanted to, to answer. I was going to say, Peter, why don't you keep going? Because I know you have a little bit more left to get through and then we can um, compile at the end. There, there's an overwhelming, overwhelmingly uh, amount of uh, questions. So why don't we keep going and see what we can get to at the end. <laughs> Well, actually, the, the, uh, you probably noticed that the, in the clip, it was a different type of um, penguin. Uh, it's the Adelie penguin, this one here with a little white uh, ring around its eye. So the, the penguins you will see on the, the Antarctic Peninsula mainly are the, the Gen 2 penguin with the headphones, the chinstrap penguin with that black line, and the, the Adelie penguin, this one here, which uh, nests the furthest south of, uh, of those groups. And I think these are the maddest penguins, especially the, uh, the young ones. And so um, we 
obviously we're I'm trying to make a film so when we're there we're not just watching we are trying to to film it and with the this is with the chin strap deception again but when we were filming the daily penguins with chicks when we turned our backs they were so mischievous I just thought you might like to see that any equipment we left out the baby penguins because they were obviously a little bit bored would come over and play king of the castle so you can see that here they are they jump onto our, our uh, camera cases they these camera cases are all closed can you see that we never left them open actually after the first couple of days because these little baby uh, daily penguin chicks would jump in there and leave a little calling card and cover our kit with guano so we had to, to change that and also we had to um, take away the plastic that we were using to um, to cover our bags if it was raining or snowing because the the chicks got so confused they thought it was water and so they'd start flapping and swimming along the plastic um, and we couldn't concentrate to be honest it was very very funny um, so uh, very, they, as I said earlier, they're very, very curious. If you stop still, um, the penguins often come up and they want to investigate you. So um, now, why have I put, I know I've put this picture in, especially for a lovely couple called uh, Beth and George Adams from, Vir from Richmond, Virginia, uh, who have been on a couple of my trips. And uh, when I, they heard that I was giving the, this uh, webinar I said oh please please can you show the picture this picture and this is the one um, again it's on Deception Island the last time we saw this those slopes in the background were in thick snow um, and this day they um, it was very warm and all the snow melted so this, the, the melt water trickled the, down through the colonies and picked up lots of pink guano all the droppings from the penguins that had been eating krill. And because of gravity, all of the trickles formed into rivulets, then to rivers, and then our tents were at the bottom of an amphitheatre. And we call it the day that we were hit by a punami, as a wave of penguin poo came through and drenched our tents. Um, it, <laughs> it kind of, I had a, my one luxury there was a pillow and when I went back to my tent the pillow weighed about 15 pounds because it would absorbed all of this punami that went past and eventually we had to to dig little trenches above our tents to deflect these um, little poo rivers away but uh, anyway George and Beth that one's for you um, so on to the next one. Oh yes and we will on the uh, on these trips we go to a number of different locations this place is called Coverville Island and we went there uh, last January we filmed Gen 2 penguins here and this again is the view from my my tent and I wanted to put this one in because I really encourage you if you do get a chance to go to Antarctica to take time to stop Go away from everybody else, don't take any pictures, close your eyes and just have a quiet moment, absorb the sounds, the smells, there are quite a lot of the smells there, um, and just have a little reflect. Um, in that tent, um, I'd been away from home for about a month, there were no gas bills, no traffic noise, we'd had some nice filming, and for the first time in my life, at 30 years of age, looking out of that tent, I reflected on how self-absorbed I had been. And I realized that I'd not, uh, that I'd taken my mother for granted. And I vowed in that moment to go home and take, when I went home, I am going to take my mother traveling because she'd sacrificed her life to raise me and my brothers and sister. And, it, that was the first time that I'd had that mental clarity to understand what was important in life. And Antarctica has that ability to do that to people. You have these mind changing moments. And I've, I've been on a trip with a banker who decided to become a whale biologist and was successful. They study sperm whales now. 
And um, on one of the cruises I was on, a, one of the, like a CEO of a major company in Britain, completely changed his views on environmental policies for his company, all from being lost in Antarctica. So I please encourage you, if you go there, to make sure you don't rush and take too many pictures, but to have a quiet moment. So um, anyway, that was uh, uh, a special moment for me uh, in Antarctica. But uh, Antarctica is not just about penguins and, and ice. And I thought I'd give you an idea of some of the things, these are this, all of the species we're going to see now, I saw on the last trip to the peninsula with Tauk. They're not shot on that trip, but they are the same species. And so if you're lucky, you see these, uh, oh, just offshore, humpback whales. Uh, they come here to feed. Uh, they do a wonderful bubble netting behavior that I have seen on previous trips. Um, but this time, um, a mother and a calf started to breach, that's to leap out of the water. And the French captain counted every time the mother breached. And it was 105 times she leapt out of the water. Can you believe it? 105 times. And everybody just was transfixed. I would show you a picture, but I decided not to take a picture. I wanted to just enjoy the moment. And I'd encourage you to do that. So um, the humpback whales um, are a fantastic uh, animal to see. And you see a few more of those actually after Christmas, later in the season when the plankton has uh, formed and the, the krill and the fish come in. Well, it's mainly the krill, sorry. This was a picture from my balcony. Any ideas what this is? And uh, within about 30 meters, orca. Killer whales, a different type of killer whale to the one we saw on the way down. Can you see the white stripe behind its uh, eye here um, is a lot larger. That's its blowhole there. And we were very, very lucky that the, for, uh, I don't know, about half an hour, the ship was followed by a pod of them. And some of these killer whales can travel about two, a hundred or so kilometers a day searching for their prey. Uh, some of them feed on penguins, others feed on seals. And they have a particular taste for this one, which is the, uh, the only seal to spend all year in Antarctica in the deep south. Uh, when it's iced up in the winter. This is a Weddell seal, a very, very smiley face, a very charming looking seal um, that they, uh, <clears throat> that are, as I said, sometimes hunted by the orca. And um, if you're very, very lucky, uh, some tourists have seen it, a pod of orca will work together and create a bow wave that will wash these seals off these icebergs that they're having a doze on. I've never seen it, I'd love to see it, but um, it's a very, very special bit of behavior. So the other seals you can see on a trip like this are the crab eater seal. Uh, this one looks a bit more dog-like um, and it doesn't eat crabs, it eats krill and it has special teeth to filter the krill from the, um, from the water. Um, it is sometimes attacked by orca, but very often the young ones are attacked by this, this, the main seal predator, this is a leopard seal that I think looks like a, an anaconda sometimes. Um, when they get very, very close to the zodiacs, they can be quite intimidated, I must admit. Uh, they have little leopard sp spots on the side there. And if you see one with its mouth open like this, you can see that it has got some decent teeth and it has got um, some, not only the, the killer canines there, but it has teeth with cusps on that allow it to strain krill as well. So it eats a bit of everything, um, but it loves young penguins when they fledge, if you're there later in the season, and also young crab eater seals. And so when we filmed them, we had to make sure our cameraman was bigger than a one-year-old crab eater seal to make sure it was safe. Um, and a bit like uh, a cat and a mouse, when these leopard seals are are catching young young penguins, they like to come up and show the cameramen the, the penguin in the water. It was a, a very, very bizarre bit of behavior, but that's what they did. They were very intrigued by our cameramen. Um, the other uh, species don't really breed 
in the Antarctic Peninsula. They breed on islands to the north in South Georgia. Uh, this one's a, an Antarctic fur seal. And there are, used to be millions, well, there are, <laughs> they're, they're, they're back to good numbers again now, but they were hunted to extinction, they thought, at the end of the 1890s. Um, and a single male one of these was spotted in 1916 by some biologists, which <laughs> you won't believe this, but they, they actually shot it because they wanted to check to make sure it was one of the extinct species. It, um, I don't quite understand <laughs> why they do that type of thing, but now there are very, very healthy numbers of them uh, on South Georgia, and you'll see those in the Antarctic Peninsula. And also the largest seal, the elephant seal, can you see with this big proboscis, some males are 14, 15 feet long. They're huge. And when they raise up, when they're fighting, you know, they will be above uh, the ceiling that I've got here. Um, but as I said, they are gentle giants, actually, when you see them uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula, because a lot of them there come to, to molt. For 40 days, they molt their skin, and so they have to come out of the water, and they lie across, or lie beside each other, and, uh, and molt their skins. Um, and we filmed this actually for Life in the Freezer. And it was very, very funny to watch the young, those mischievous uh, daily chicks I was talking about earlier. They loved pulling the flakes of skin off, much to the irritation of the seals, but they would just run backwards and forwards and try and sneak a little bit more of the skin off and play with it. Um, other surprises. On the last trip, I'd never ever seen one of these before. This is a lion's mane jellyfish that we were able to come alongside in the zodiacs. Um, and also, if you're lucky, sometimes you'll see slope of snow algae. As the snows start to melt, it concentrates these algae that live in the snow together. This is a bank of, um, of green snow algae at Peterman Island, but it's not only green, you also find it red. It's almost as though the, the snow and ice is um, covered with blood, I think, almost sometimes. Um, and so, as I said, there, you can get wonderful surprises. It's an expedition, so you don't know quite what you're going to see. But I saw all of these species and these phenomenon on the last um, trip in January. Um, but I just wanted to go back to say, but there are other surprises. Um, not last year, the year before. Um, the ship was not able to go down the western side of the Antarctic Peninsula, where my cursor is at the moment, as there was too much ice. Um, but the expedition team found, discovered that the Weddell Sea, the other side of the Antarctic Peninsula, very unusually was free of ice in places. And so they decided to sail north and around the peninsula. I'd never been there. And it, we had um, quite a surprise um, because what to begin with, I was giving a talk and um, again, the captain came over the town and said, just to let you know, there's an emperor penguin just outside the ship. And again, everybody left the, um, the, the lecture room, apart from those that were still asleep, uh, I jest. And, um, and they rushed to see the emperor penguin. It's the only time I've ever seen an emperor penguin in the, fr the eight visits I've been there. And who would have guessed we would have been um, on the other side of the uh, Antarctic Peninsula to see emperor penguins that we don't really see on the other side. Um, but we also, and I'll just show you something else here, sorry. We, we came to a place, uh, can you see Paulette Island and then Hope Bay? Well, but to the south of Hope Bay, we came to a place called Snow Hill Island. And for people who uh, love history and Antarctic history, this is a very famous place because it's, it is the location of the 19, it's the hut of the 1901 Swedish Antarctic expedition with Otto Nordenskjöld. And you can go to the hut today. So it was built in 1901. There it is. I, all the people I know that have been to Antarctica many, many times, have never had the opportunity to go here. I could not believe my luck. And you are able to leave your boots outside and go in and see how these people left. There were five people left here 
in 1902 uh, to spend the winter to do some uh, exploring and to take find fossils etc and you can go in and we had a look at the uh, the way they lived their stoves their beds all perfectly preserved and for those of you um, who know anything about Antarctic history you probably know about Scott and you also know about Shackleton um, but there's a little known story about this Antarctic expedition if you look to the bottom here, this is the place called Snow Hill. I hope you can all see it. That is where the hut is. And um, they were dropped off there, as I said, in the, well, the February of 1902. Um, and the ship left, five of them went north and was meant to come back in December to pick them up after they'd spent the winter there um, and taken all of their, uh, their studies. Um, but what happened next was was really quite extraordinary because um, they were there expecting to co come back again as i said to to return in the december but the following uh december the ship came back from the falkland islands past deception island here to the left and down this little sound called antarctic sound to collect them but it was so full of ice the ship couldn't go and collect them it was impossible to get through and so they dropped three people off in a place called hope bay it's actually called esperanza on here so that they could walk down the 75 kilometers to snow hill island and say look come north the boat can't get through and uh, we'll pick you up here because they thought that the the people could walk down because it would be solid ice in truth they couldn't um, in the january they realized that there was open sea here and they couldn't get across and so they went back the three people to hope bay to wait for the ship to pick them up again but the ship never came because the ship tried to make one more um exploration of this sound got trapped in the ice and sank and 20 people and the cat um, had to walk across the ice and row across to an island called Paulette Island. Can you see it there? And so at the end, so when it came to February, they all knew that they'd have to spend a, a winter there. They didn't have the supplies. So, and they didn't know the fate of any of their colleagues. And so, because there were no communications, and so they all had to kill penguins and seals to survive the winter. Um, to cut a long story short, the ship didn't obviously return, and so a rescue mission was sent out the next year, but they didn't know that. Uh, and the three people who overwintered at Esperanza, when the, uh, the light came back, they, they started to walk down to Snow Hill at the same time as some people from Snow Hill were going north to explore. And they looked out from a place called Cape Well Met here on Vega Island, and they saw three black, uh, dark shapes walking across the ice. So the leader of the, um, the group from Snow Hill, Nordenskjöl, he thought they were huge penguins, you know, black penguins, but they realized it was three of his comrades and he was ecstatic, he was so happy. And they all went to Snow Hill Island. And then he had the thought that everybody else had perished. And so he was very, very upset. But when they uh, met up on Cape Well Met, five people from the 20 who were on Paulette Island decided to, to row across to Hope Bay. They obviously had missed the people who were staying there. And so they rowed all the way down to Snow Hill. They say that they think they rode 180 kilometers and on the day that the rescue ship, the Uruguay, came, got to Snow Hill, this group of five people arrived too. And so Otto Nordenskjöl was the most happy people, person on earth to know that all of his uh, crew were safe and on the way back they picked up people from Paulette Island and then went back to Buenos Aires. Sorry to give you a bit of a history lesson, but it's a wonderful, wonderful story. And there's so many wonderful historical um, artifacts around the Antarctic 
Peninsula to Sea. And that is the ship. It's called the Uruguay. It sailed back to Buenos Aires with them all on board. 100,000 people turned out to, to meet them. And there it is in front of the Hilton Hotel where you will stay if you go on a journey with Tank to the Antarctic Peninsula. So there's your own little museum to have a look at in Buenos Aires if you have the time. And you're probably thinking, what type of person actually decided to go on an expedition like that? And I thought you might quite like to see this advert that Shackleton put in the paper before his expedition. And it says, men wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honour and recognition in case of success. Right to Ernest Shackleton, for Burlington Street. And I think, <laughs> what a, an amazing uh, advertisement. And apparently he got more than a thousand replies. So people obviously wanted the adventure. So that's my last little story. I hope we haven't run over too much. Uh, just to end with, here's a couple of shots of the ice world to get to whet your appetite to go and see the ice in Antarctica. And one little surprise, that actually isn't ice, it's a surprise from Tauk. It's people loaded with a farewell drink to, uh, for, for some champagne to everybody who's on the expedition. And so I wanted to say thank you very much indeed for listening. As it's eight o'clock now in the UK, I can have a glass of wine with all of the tour directors here. So I hope I meet you on a future um, Tauk trip to Antarctica. Uh, thank you very much indeed for listening and, th and again um, hello to all the people who have been to my lectures in the past. Thank you Justin, thanks for inviting me. Cheers. Thank you, thank you so much Peter, we're all, we're all jealous of you right now. Um, that was fantastic, really informative, engaging, um, really loved that story at the end there, that was great. Uh, we are at time, we're a little bit over time obviously, there are, like I said before, a massive amount of questions. So we obviously will not be able to get to all of them. So I will take these questions back to, to the team here and try to get them answered for you all. Some were very specific about the tour. So we'll get them answered and we'll put them up on our blog page at some point uh, next week. Um, but if you do have time, Peter, I'll get to a couple of more general questions that I think uh, a lot of people were interested in. And for those of you who are on, feel free to feel free to uh, leave if you need to. Um, we appreciate your time and thank you. And if you'd like to stay on for another 10 minutes or so, we'll get to a couple questions. So, uh, Peter, a lot of people were interested about the differences uh, of the icebergs since your first trip there and your most recent, if you can speak to that a little bit. Um, what in, in how many I saw? I, I think uh, just in the, the the look of them, or melt, you know, melting, or different ones formed, or would you know that sort of thing. Yeah, there's a little chart of various stages in the kind of the degra degradation of an iceberg, um, and as Dougie said in in his the little video clip, you know, um, uh, Doug Allen is a very famous wildlife cameraman. Um, yet yeah, some of them are miles, miles long. You cannot believe they are icebergs. And those um, uh, huge bergs, you can only really find, as, as Doug said, in the Antarctic. Um, where um, you come across the, the, the icebergs very often along the Antarctic Circle is where you come, the ship goes into slightly uh, shallower channels because these large icebergs get grounded and they form what they call iceberg graveyards and they just stick there until the the water and the waves act upon them where they then might crack into or they might just spin over i've seen a number of times icebergs spinning backwards and forwards backwards and forwards before they break up some of these smaller bergy bits uh, are known to kind of well, i've seen them they, they they almost explode sometimes they just reach that critical moment where they almost spontaneously break up uh, some of the icebergs, as I said, are deep, deep blue, um, lovely shades of blue. The, some smaller pieces are absolutely crystal clear. I'm told, I'm not a, a glaciologist, but some of those are over 100,000 years old. I, I was told on the last um, trip because um, 
one of the joys of being on those trips is that you you do have lectures by not only myself but um, by experts in the field so there are glaciologists penguin biologists um, hot botanists etc and um, so yeah you, you can learn a lot about icebergs on the ship and if you as I said there is a a little chart of the various different types of icebergs according to size um, is that basically what you, you were after? Yeah. Yeah, no, that was great. Thanks, Peter. Um, a lot of questions came through, and just because you've been there a number of times, uh, about how physically difficult it is, um, you know, day to day. And can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, do you know, I give a, one of the talks I give uh, is solely about living on Deception Island. As I said, it was grueling there, you know, because you have to, there's nobody to make your food, so you, you film uh all day you go down to the beach pick up a bit of iceberg melt it down make a cup of tea from it and just making a cup of tea can take an hour um sometimes you've got to make sure there's no penguin guano on the iceberg you select to melt down um and if you i've, I've got to say the easiest thing if it's minus five or minus ten you much prefer working then rather than it being at um at freezing point because if it's minus 10, everything's frozen and you can stay dry. And if you're layered properly, you don't get cold. At freezing point, it just, things just get wet. And <laughs> I'm afraid to say penguin poo becomes like Velcro at freezing point and it sticks to everything, you know, and you get covered in it. And I, I, I used to say to people that I would leave my tent at five foot nine and when I came back, I was six foot two because so much penguin poo had stuck to my boots. Um, and it, it, it saps your energy. Um, and I would love to say that if, if I could have had somebody to do all the food, that would make it a lot easier. Obviously, you don't have running water and you don't want to, and it's difficult to melt too much water. So when I was on Deception Island for a month, uh, near enough, uh, I didn't wash my hair once in all that time. Uh, funnily enough, it, it, it goes greasy, but then it goes, it, it, it returns to normal quite soon afterwards. And I've got quite a few funny uh, anecdotes about actually meeting people for the first time and being in a warm room and um, people looking at me very quizzically and I was saying, why? And I've suddenly realized that I was in a warm room, I was thawing out and I just stank of penguin. And people ask me to sit next to the door, you know. <laughs> so um, uh, it was a bit of a liability in that respect. But um, but well, I, I I couldn't say it was a. Although it was grueling, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Um, and as I said, it was exceptional at Deception Island because there was a. We were told that the island was in risk of of erupting. The a base on the island had risen a metre in a week and they thought there was going to be an explosion and did we want to to leave the island you know things like that happen and they kind of burn themselves in your mind well just so everyone's clear peter's describing his filmmaking journeys not not a journey <laughs> you'd have with talc down down there you definitely wouldn't be covered uh, in penguin poo or um you know not have in making an hour to, to have a cup of tea so peter's definitely describing him filming but peter from your perspective on being on the talc ship or the finance ship with talc um from that respect um physically uh what would you advise the guests oh i see um on the ship well, obviously, uh, you get your uh, you get notes from Tag before you leave, uh, which tells you about layering and the types of gloves to, to take with you. But your outer shell will be provided for you know the park and the boots, um, and so you basically use those Wellington boots on every journey off the ship. On the ship, deck shoes are fine. It's a very comfortable ship, you know, with fine dining in the in the restaurants and what have you um, and as I said uh, earlier make sure if you do get seasick to see your doctor just to make sure you get the right sort of um, of tablets uh, I've I was awful as I said and now I seem to have cracked it and um, there is there is a kind of a, a bit of chemistry for you I hope so you won't get it 
when we went for the first time in 1991, the BBC gave us special tablets for seasickness. And we all said they, they worked because we all got seasick. <laughs> it just seemed that they were the wrong, the wrong type of, of tablet for us. Uh, now I'm on a different uh, type of, of medication and, and I'm fine. <laughs> Good. Um, okay. From a, from a climate change perspective, Peter, um, how have you seen it or how do you know if it's changed, you know, the wildlife down there um, and also, you know, iceberg? Yeah, I don't, I'm not down there often enough to kind of notice it firsthand. Obviously, um, there are glaciers that are retreating on places like South Georgia that that are well documented. And um, there's a lot of science to say that the, the ice is melting. You, you hear, hear it all the time. I would definitely recommend that um, you, you read up on that. There are some wonderful uh, books and, and articles and actually many um, programs on the, the, the state of global warming um, and the effect on Antarctica. There's a lot of research going on down there at the moment, obviously. Is there a vegetation on Deception Island? Uh, uh, vegetation, well, there are, I think in Antarctica, there are three flowering plants and they're like little grasses. I have seen them on some of the islands. Uh, in fact, I, I did point out um, uh, one of the grasses to uh, some um, of the guests on, on our last trip. Yeah, they're, they're in little, little pockets. There are, there are some mosses there as well. Um, the big areas of colour are from algae. Uh, it, Deception Island, that was an algae on the, on the, on the mud, uh, on the soily, uh, the volcanic ash there. Uh, but on the snow, you see those big areas of very, very simple plants called algae that, that stay in the snow, green or red. Um, but um, yeah, you have to look very, very closely to, to find any of those grasses that I was talking about. I, actually, I have got some pictures, but I thought that they wouldn't, and I had to try and, I had to take some out. I thought you'd probably be more interested to see a whale or a seal than a, a, a couple of blades of grass. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you're right there, Peter. Um, okay, two more. One about penguins. Uh, there was a question that came through about um, baby penguins and when, are they born in a particular, at a particular time, a particular month? Um, um, well, uh, they, the, the nests, the penguins arrive before Christmas and they're making their nests. It, obviously, it does differ according to how far south you go uh, because the penguins have to wait until the, um, the, the nesting colonies are clear of snow. But before Christmas, to the places we're going um, in the, on the Antarctic Peninsula, you've got nests and eggs before Christmas. And after Christmas in January, you're seeing young chicks um, and into February got larger chicks but actually um, you can see in January a bit of everything because some um, eggs may be stolen by uh, birds like skewers or gulls and they will relay uh, if, they, if they lose their nest or as they lose their egg the, the, um, some of the pairs will, will go again and so you can see nest building, courtship and um, young chicks and you know medium-sized chicks all together in January, um, and, th and that's great. In fact, I've seen uh, mating as well, penguins mating, on each of the trips I've made with Tauk. I've gone mainly in January with with yourselves, but I have been there before Christmas too, and in February. Um, cool. All right, last one. How cold actually is it when you're there? Um, we were there in the, in the summer. Uh, on my first trip with Tauk, we actually went down to the Antarctic Circle. And so it was 24 hour daylight. And we had very, very nice weather. And to be honest, um, most people uh, put all their layers on and their parka and they overheated. Um, and so um, it's, I think at, on some of the days it was plus five and when you're in the sun and there's no wind it felt like a lot warmer than that however you've got to be so careful because it can change just like that 
and when the winds get up and you get the wind chill you can suddenly get very very cold but um i have to say on, on the last trip i actually didn't wear gloves at any time during the trip i don't know if that means that i'm extra cold tolerant or not but um uh but um, I'll, I'll tell a lie on the Zodiacs going across when we were going to the colonies, I put a pair of waterproof gloves on. But on shore, I didn't have uh, gloves on at all. Uh, and partly because I like to take a few pictures now and again, and it's easier to do it without any gloves on. But um, I would say that um, it's usually over freezing point. Uh, in the evenings, obviously, it's, uh, it's close to freezing. And I suppose. It's, it's, it's about minus five on some of the colder days when on the trips that I've been on maybe there are if I was in a, a, a more exceptional weather pattern it might be a lot colder in fact I don't know if it snowed on the last trip we had a very very good weather actually hmm. and I'm, I'm assuming you're talking Celsius in, 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 in that fair mm. yes yes okay. I, yeah. <laughs> we keep on <laughs> yeah, he's talking Celsius. If you, if you're yeah, in. sorry, I said kilometers as well instead of miles, didn't I? I just realised there's a uh, an imperial versus metric thing going on as well. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Peter. We're about we're about twenty minutes over. So thank you again, Peter, for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. Thank you uh, to all the guests who joined and who stayed on for an extra an extra twenty minutes or so to listen to Peter and I chat. Uh, we really do appreciate it. I really do appreciate your interest, and we are all longing to get out there again, um, and we will, and we will soon. And we're 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 hoping for that. We're positive. Um, and again, thank you for joining. And there are a ton of questions. Again, I will write them down and, and uh, record them on my end, and hopefully Peter can help me out, and I'll get some um, some other talc folks to help out with some trip specific questions and we'll get them out on our uh, blog post page shortly. So thank you again, Peter. Um, and um, we will see you. We will see you again. Thanks all. Thank you for inviting me and have a good night, everybody.